Jeffrey Dahmer murdered 17 young men over a 13 year period, gutting them like fish for his own sexual perversion. Then eating their thighs, their breasts, their cock, like a goddamn bucket of chicken. And he liked the dark meat too. So tell me, what would turn a shy, inward child into history's most depraved querial killer? On this episode of Diagnosis to Murder, with the assistance of forensic psychiatrist Shaham Das, we will attempt to find out. An estimated 6.1 per 100,000 of the general world population will be murdered this year. What makes a killer? Is it a trait that we all share as sentient beings? Or is it something unique to the individual? Brought on by nurturing in a rage, we live in a time where lies and manipulation are the dueling blades of the day, where life is cheap, a commodity. Welcome to Deadbug's Diagnosis to Murder with your host, Deadbug, with co-host, forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Shaham Das. Rarely in this life do we have the luxury of choosing our departure date. And most of us wouldn't want to even if we could, with the majority wanting one more chance at the proverbial crap table, a chance to play one more hand. Yet there are many who believe that being a gay man in the 80s and early 90s was stepping up to that crap table every day. With the autoimmune deficiency virus labeled in the press at the time as the gay cancer, gay men were turned into objects of fear, with many still closeted, keeping their extracurricular movements a secret. And it was under this climate that Jeffrey Dahmer sought his prey. And what better way to understand those crimes than with the assistance of the good doctor. Hello, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist based in London in the UK. I assess mentally disordered offenders, sometimes in courts, in prisons, and in lot psychiatric units. And also I work as an expert witness, which means that I give professional evidence in courts during criminal trials, including murder trials. If you're interested in this kind of area, you should definitely go and check out my YouTube channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. I dissect a smorgasbord of topics related to criminality and mental illness and the crossover between the two. Okay, doctor, time is money and I hate wasting it. So let's get into this. Deadbug, is that you? Ugh, thought I could smell something fishy. That smell, Das, is the smell of a real man. I understand how you might not recognize it, but breathe it in. It may bring you some luck. Now I know there's cases everywhere at the moment, but I'm still gonna give you a bit of a refresher on it. Okay, let's get going. Jeffrey Dahmer came from a hardworking middle-class family. Born in Milwaukee, the first child of Joyce and Lionel Dahmer, with his father a chemist and his mother a homemaker. But the cracks in that ideal life started to show themselves early. By all accounts, Jeffrey's mother was a bitch, self-serving, self-centered, and self-righteous. With the father forced to work long hours, the kids were left alone with the mother, who seemed a mother in name only, spending most of the time in bed from anxiety attacks and depression, leaving Jeffrey and his younger brother to fend for themselves. It was one of those days that Jeffrey, abandoned by his mother, came across some roadkill, and he became fascinated with it. From then on, he would collect dead animals, cats, dogs, and dissect them. And his father encouraged this, thinking it was an inquisitive, scientific mind. It was when he was 13 that Jeffrey discovered that he liked ass pussy after a sexual encounter with a classmate. But it was also at the time of this awakening there seemed a bizarre crossing of his emotional wiring because the same pleasure that he was getting from jerking off to his amigos, he was receiving from the roadkill. High school was difficult for Jeffrey. He was bullied and an outcast. With his father showing concern that he had no friends and didn't like girls. When he was 17, 
the parents separated and his father moved into a motel, with his mother then leaving and taking his younger brother with her. Jeff was now a homo, alone, already drinking heavily since he was 13 years old. Now he was on a free fall, and it was at this time, with his parents away, alone in the house, he committed his first murder, bringing him home, killing him, fucking him, cutting him up, putting the body under the house. Now worried about his son, Lionel Dahmer moved home with his new girlfriend, and Jeffrey started college. But when he dropped out from his drinking, his father insisted he join the army. Signing up as a field medic, he would later admit it was a great place to learn about the male anatomy. Discharged a short time afterwards for his heavy drinking, his father was disappointed and sent him to live with his grandmother. After finding God for a short time, curtailing his homo ways, it didn't last because he now had the hunger. And when you got the hunger, you gotta feed. And he slid back into his old ways. And the ass pussy became his God. But his grandmother got sick of his extracurricular activity, including killing four men, and she eventually kicked him out. Dharma got his own place and started cruising the bathhouses drugging his victims and having sex with them, all while he worked as a chocolate dipper at a chocolate factory. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. But when he almost killed someone, he was banned from every homo hangout in town. And that's when he started bringing the party back to his place. Turning every rent boy into a four course meal. Hey, does this gay taste overcooked to you? After several close calls, he was eventually apprehended in 1991. With the cops discovering what can only be described as a house of whores, removing box after box of human remains. And far from denying it, Dahmer wanted to tell the cops the whole sordid story. With his final scorecard being 17, or at least that's what he remembers, he would later tell prison psychiatrists that his parents' constant bickering as he grew up would have an adverse effect on his psyche. He was murdered by a fellow inmate in 1994. Okay, doctor, you got your rundown. Now it's time to earn that meal I promised you. First question, Dharma. He's a middle-class kid from a middle-class America. And at one point, when he was seven, he saw some roadkill, a dead rabbit. And this triggered something, and he brought it home, he dissected it. And from this point, he continued with dogs, cats, and started a collection. Is this a normal part of child development, or are we seeing signs here that something is very wrong? Well... There's definitely something abnormal going on, but I don't think that it indicates there's something very wrong at this stage. He's definitely odd, but I don't think it's necessarily worrying because he's just got a fascination with the human form, with anatomy. At this point, Dharma could have been a potential heart surgeon, I would say. Yeah, a heart surgeon who likes drugging, killing, then fucking guys' asses. I'm just messing with you, Das. Continue. And he wasn't actually hurting animals at this point. He was just kind of interested in what goes on inside them in the anatomy. Later as a teenager, Jeffrey Dahmer apparently hurt a live fish and actually seemed to take pleasure in its suffering. So I think at that point, he'd sort of developed a sadistic personality, but not quite yet in his childhood. Dahmer's parents were having issues in their relationship and his father worked long hours as a scientist and the mother suffered from depression and disengaged from the family's day-to-day -day activities. And this left Jeffrey isolated, spending a lot of time on his own without adult supervision. Doctor, what insight does this give you on how a young Jeffrey Dahmer must have been feeling at this time? I think Jeffrey Dahmer definitely would have felt abandoned to a degree. So his mother might have physically been there, but she was not emotionally available. She was not supportive. She didn't particularly engage with him and his father wasn't around that much because he worked such long hours. So what did that mean for Jeffrey Dahmer? I think he would have realized early on that he's quite independent. He's got full autonomy for his behaviors and his actions. There's little, little supervision. And therefore that means there's little consequences to his actions. So he could break the law with impunity. You know, he could start drinking and nobody really cared. So I imagine this would have left him with mixed feelings. On the one hand, it would have been pretty liberating, but on the other hand, it would have been kind of a bit tragic and lonely to a degree. I would point out there's lots of people, lots of kids in a similar situation, and only a small proportion of them go on to be offenders. And it's generally petty, low-level crimes. It's not murder and necrophilia and cannibalism. So what I'm saying is 
the abandonment kind of issue is, is definitely a factor, but it doesn't explain everything. When he was 14, he started having his first homosexual uh, experiences or awakening or whatever you want to call it. All this while he was collecting and dissecting roadkill. Is it possible that these two things happening at once could have crossed his wiring, so to speak, and intertwined, causing the subject to be now linking death with arousal? So wiring intertwined causing a subject who's death, who's linking death with arousal. That's an interesting question, Sir Bug. Um, it's difficult to know without examining his actual thought processes at the time, but what we do know is that paraphilia, which is a mental illness that I will come on to, can be caused by people associating sexual arousal with being around a situation or a type of person or an object. So absolutely it's feasible that if he got sexual arousal around the time that he was seeing all these dead animals, etc., and he kind of linked the two, then that could have caused his paraphilia, absolutely. But I would say that his obsession with killing came later on in his life, much later than when he was having his first sexual experiences. Dharma developed a drinking problem when he was only 12 years old, and he was severely bullied at school, increasing his feelings of isolation. Now at this point, along with all the other elements, has a killer already formed? Or is this nothing that couldn't have been remedied by a school counselor, psychiatrist, or his parents just showing a little TLC? Well, I think when we, when we look at this, this kind of whole scenario, there's definitely some elements that are put in place. So Dharma is probably already feeling withdrawn, isolated. He's already feeling marginalized. He probably harbors some sort of hatred towards society as a whole. But this, again, doesn't paint the full picture. There's still more steps. There's more layers before he becomes this megalom megalomaniacal maniac killer. So I definitely think at this point in his life, he absolutely could have been helped. So if he had some sort of support, some sort of guidance, some sort of direction, if he felt loved, if he had somebody that showed him compassion and empathy, then yeah, completely convinced he could have changed at this point. Now Dharma admitted reading an article in the newspaper about a teen boy who had been killed in a motorcycle accident. And he said he fell in love with the picture of this guy. And then he went to the funeral home and he viewed the body. And he became so turned on that he had to go to b the bathroom and jerk off and blow his load. I mean, so what the fuck are we seeing here? I mean, is this a mental illness? A personality disorder? A psychopath? Or are all of these things the same, but to a different degree? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what are we seeing here? I think this indicates a paraphilia. So a paraphilia is a mental illness, it's not a personality disorder. Personality disorder is much more pervasive. It's about very specific personality traits that affect uh, somebody's interactions and every aspect of their life and all their behavior. A paraphilia is more akin to like an obsession or a compulsion, a bit like OCD. So it is basically where an individual connects sexuality with something that would be considered by most of society to be bizarre, whether it's a fetish, a particular ind individual, a type of individual, an object, a scenario, nappies, etc., etc. And it takes, paraphilia takes many different form. However, the one thing that I'd say is having these beliefs or these impulsive or, or their thoughts, even if they are involuntary, and they are thought to be involuntary, paraphilia is just like your sexuality is involuntary, that in itself isn't the problem. It is acting upon them, actually going and committing crimes, hurting people, you know, offending against kids. That is the problem. You know, to me, it takes one form. You're a fucking nutcase. <laughs> But you know, I mean, I ain't no expert doctor, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with you on that one. Now here's one for you, Das. Had Dahmer's repressed sexuality caused any of his behavioral patterns? We see these same elements in John Wayne Gacy and his crimes, as well as several other serial killers or querial killers, as I like to call them, who have been repressing their sexual leanings. Yeah, I do think there's a link between Dahmer's repressed sexuality and some of his behaviors not only because of his own discomfort with his sexuality, but societies. Because we've got to remember that gay people were very much judged in this era, kind of, you know, late 80s into the 90s. This was the height of the AIDS epidemic in America. And a lot of people, a lot of politicians even, were kind of either directly or indirectly linking the AIDS epidemic to being the fault of gay people. So it was a hard time to be gay, it wasn't acceptable. So I wonder whether Dharma repressed 
his sexuality to a degree. I mean, he was openly gay at one point, but earlier on, if he repressed it and he wanted to harm other people that represented the part of him that he was ashamed of. Having said all that, I would also stress that the vast, vast majority of people who were gay from this era did not offend. So it's not, again, not one individual factor explains Jeffrey Dahmer. It is, it's a layer upon layer, uh, a collection of many different factors. Now, for a short time, he found God when he lived with his grandmother. Is this the same repression that you have in the church with priests that are gay and they like to molest kids? And can religion be a successful inhibitor or is it just a proverbial finger in the dike? No, I don't think I can agree with you, Degbug. So repressed priests are kind of stuck in this pious lifestyle and they can't release their sexual urges in, in a healthy manner in any way. They're also kind of forced to hide and deny their own natural being, their own sexuality. Whereas Dharma could, if he wanted to, get sexual gratification with men in a normal, healthy way, but he chose to do it in a horrifically violent manner. Plus, priests are homosexual priests, that is, repress their, the sexual element of their, of their thoughts and their intentions, their behavior, but Dharma was openly gay, so it's very different. I'm sorry, but I think you're dead bugging up the wrong tree. His first victim was a hitchhiker who he picked up and he didn't want the kid to leave, so he killed him. Now, this was a theme of all Dharma's murders. How does this differ from the other serial killers? Am I correct in saying that, that he's less predatorially minded than, say, a Ted Bundy or a John Wayne Gacy? Who, for me, they definitely seem more aggressive in their planning and their final attempts to seal the deal. Well, I don't think Dharma was any less predatory, and he certainly wasn't any less damaging, but we can't overlook that he had this macabre interest in anatomy and in dissecting, in dismembering, in keeping body parts. So his motivations were different, but ultimately it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they're all serial killers. They all ended many lives. That's the important bit. He drugged his partners that he met in the bathhouses that he frequented. I guess also his home as well. And he was banned when found out. What is he getting from these interactions? Is it power alone or are there other elements than just having a completely subservient partner? I think the very fact that he drugged all these men just shows that he did not want and was not interested in a healthy, normal, consensual sexual experience. I think he wanted complete dominance and power, making his victims almost inanimate objects. That's what they were to him when they were heavily drugged and later on when they were dead. And I think this is part of his sexual perversion, part of his paraphilia if you want to sound clever like a psychiatrist. Now, when you got a personality like Dharma's, are we dealing with a narcissist here? Or is it someone with a very strong sense of self-loathing? Uh, would I? I'm not sure that I put him in either category, to be honest with you, Bug. Narcissistic or self-loathing. He was definitely entitled, and his sexual needs he placed well above the well-being and even the survival of his victims. But Dharma doesn't really strike me as somebody who's overly narcissistic. He's not like a show-off. He's not charming like Ted Bundy was. He might have had a degree of self-loathing, as I've said before, might have explained why he attacked uh, gay people. He might have been uncomfortable with this part of his persona to a degree. But again, entitlement, the other character traits that really stand out to me is his complete indifference and callousness. He didn't even see, I think, his victims as living people. He just saw them as objects for his sexual gratification. Was the necrophilia and cannibalism related in any way to the absolute power and control that he sought? Or do you think the latter cannibalism was just down to curiosity because Japanese cannibal S.A. Sagawa ate his victim more out of curiosity. So I think the necrophilia is, is his desire for a non-resisting or non-rejecting partner plus just an actual attraction to dead people. That's part of his paraphilia. So I think there is probably a slight element of control, but more than that, it's his desire and his preoccupation with the, de with the form of the dead human body. So that explains his necrophilia, I think. Cannibalism, I'm not sure. Maybe he just wanted to have a more adventurous palate. Well, three squares a day, as they say. But why was there no revulsion in getting balls deep with a corpse? I mean, was Dharma lacking the basic human trait uh, to be able to undertake in such a horrible act? I mean, yeah, I think that's fair enough to say. Anybody who doesn't have revulsion in having sex with a corpse is lacking a basic human trait, absolutely. But again, I think to him, he sees the human bodies as not, you know, the tragic death of somebody that had a life. I think he didn't care about that. He sees them as inanimate objects and a source of his pleasure. As we get older, for most of us, the libido slows down and is less strong. 
Would Dharma have eventually stopped killing, or was there more to his crimes than just a sexual fulfillment? Have you been speaking to my wife, Deadbug? Uh, yeah, so there is a decrease in libido with age, definitely, but it usually happens, or it happens quicker, in the context of a monogamous relationship, which obviously doesn't uh, encompass what Jeffrey Barmer was doing. So I think for him it was definitely more than just about sex, as I've said before, he was intrigued about the human form. And also, remember, even though he committed a, a ridiculous amount of murders, was it 16, 17? I don't think he did it often enough that it would have affected his libido or it would have been fully libido driven because this is not like a regular sexual act. So I, I'm not sure that I'm convinced that the, the drive that he had behind it would have died out like your average libido dried out. I do think that at some point, if hypothetically speaking, Dharma never got caught for whatever reason, he just kept on doing this for the rest of his life, there would have been a point where he got too old for it, too old for this shit. But it's hard to know when that would have happened because we know that antisocial tendencies burn out in people anyway with age. There's the loss of libido, as you said yourself, Mr. Bug. And then also at some point, he would have been physically incapable to overpower his sick victims. So I don't know which one of them would have, would have given away first, but one of them would. So at some point, he'd have been too old to carry on offending like he did. In the 80s, after being arrested for several sexual assaults on underage victims, Dharma was diagnosed with a schizoid personality disorder. With everything that's played out now, how accurate do you think that diagnosis was? Uh, yeah. Ah, schizoid personality disorder. So this is a fascinating diagnosis to me. It's interesting, it's very rare in the patient group that I see. So I assess mentally disordered offenders. I work as an expert witness. Par um, uh, antisocial personality disorder is really common in my patient group, borderline to a degree, even paranoid personality disorder occasionally. Schizoid personality disorder, I think I've done somewhere over 600 criminal assessments as an expert witness. I can think of maybe two cases where I've seen this definitively diagnosed. Uh, just because usually it doesn't, isn't connected with violence or offending. So I'll tell you the typical f features of schizoid personality disorder. These people, they have a lack of interest in social relationships. They have a tendency towards like a sheltered lifestyle. They're quite secretive. They have this emotional coldness and apathy. They're described by other people as being withdrawn or aloof. They have this like rich internal fantasy world. They're quite indifferent towards other people and they tend to be distant and they avoid social situations. So I think pretty much all of those things you could say would fit um, Dharma's pattern. I think he's exactly like that. The one thing that sort of stands out to me that wouldn't be in keeping with a diagnosis of schizoid personality disorder is that usually these people have no interest in sex or in relationships. So he, he definitely did. Although you could argue that he didn't actually have an interest so much in, in sex and relationships as he did that he was just using that as an opportunity to get his victims and he was more interested in the killing and the death aspects. So yeah, so altogether, I do think that that is probably an accurate diagnosis. Obviously, I can't say definitively because I need to actually assess him in person, but from what I know about him, then yeah, that is that does seem to fit. Dharma kept his first victim's remains under his parents' house, another victim in his grandmother's basement, as well as killing and dismembering his victims in his apartment with very thin walls. Is this a guy who thought he was never going to get caught, or did he know he was doing it and it would eventually end? Um, I mean, he just, he seemed so callous and indifferent and just not bothered by when he was arrested. He didn't try and excuse his behaviour. He seemed almost nonchalant, almost resigned to his fate. So to me, that suggests that he probably knew on some level that at some point he would be caught. I don't think for any given murder he thought, I will be caught soon or I'll be caught now. And I think he tried to cover his tracks, although did it quite sloppily. But I think in the background, he would have known. Yet, despite that, I also think on top of that, he was still more brazen over time, which makes sense because criminals become emboldened if there are no legal consequences to their actions. And he'd have got used to that kind of, that kind of vibe and that kind of dynamic because there was no consequences to his antisocial behavior when he was a child because his parents didn't supervise or oversee him. Now, with all of these seemingly almost random factors that made Jeffrey Dahmer who he was or who, who he became from childhood onwards. Does this mean that there are potentially thousands of little Jeffrey Dahmers out there running around just waiting for that one missing element to light that fuse and to set them off? Or was he a freak of nature? Anybody who commits such horrific acts all 
killers or serial killers, there are definitely numerous layered contributory factors, but as I've said earlier in this video, they don't explain the whole picture. And it is actually very difficult to fully understand why somebody does something like this. So I think there are probably tens of thousands of Jeffrey Dahmers or Joffreys, as I like to call them. What I mean by that is people that have had difficult, similar childhoods, that have had you know, some form of abuse or neglect, that have this accumulation of various risk factors. There's loads of them, of course, walking around. However, luckily for us, the vast, vast majority will not become criminals. And those that do become criminals become sort of low-level, petty criminals. Only a very small proportion commit violence, and of those, only a very tiny proportion commit murder, and of those, only a tiny, tiny amount will become serial killers. So what I'm saying is it's so extremely rare that I would not worry. Hopefully I can reassure your viewers and you can all sleep at night, but don't let the dead bugs bite. Ha ha ha, I see what you did there, Dr. Das. Very clever. Okay, that's all I have to say on this case. Go chiggity chiggity, check out my YouTube channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. It's a smorgasbord of topics related to true crime with a little sprinkling of mental illness, using my experience as a forensic psychiatrist. I psychoanalyze people. For example, I've recently done um, uh, videos on Marilyn Manson and the accusations against him. I've done a videos on incels and how they operate. I've done a video on a man who killed somebody randomly with one punch when he got into a fight, had to go to prison. Um, there's a big redemption arc and how he feels and his regrets and remorse. I've done a video on that. I've done a few celebrity things recently. I've talked about Kanye West and his crazy behaviour. I've talked about Alex Belfield. If you're from the UK, you probably know who he is. BBC journalist who's just been in prison for stalking. If you're in the States, you might not have heard of him, but maybe this is your opportunity to find out. That's enough from me. Stay euthymic and do not forget, I love you. And once again, I want to thank the good doctor for lending his valuable time and insight into a subject matter that so many of us find fascinating. And I also want to thank him for being such a good sport and putting up with me. And although we don't always agree with each other, there's certainly a mutual respect there. And as I've mentioned before, this is an ongoing series that we're going to be doing together. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, please feel free to leave them in the comments section of my channel or the doctors. And while you're over there, subscribe, because us good guys got to stick together. And it takes some big balls to want to collaborate with yours truly. So until next time, this is Deadbug saying adios. Bug. <laughs>